nicely leads up to what I want to talk about. So one of the things that happens if you're in programming a lot, not just the conference, but also the field of programming, is that it gets really, really hard to understand what programming is. And I really love this story or joke about three fishes that are swimming. And this, this one older fish asks the other two little young fishes, Hey fishes, how's the water? And the little fishes say, what's water? They don't know what water is. They're in the water. The only thing they know is water. They don't have a conception of the fact that they're in some sort of fluidy, bluish thing. They've never been in air, for example. And I think many people, myself included, as we'll show from this talk, are so much in programming, they have so much preconception about what programming is, that it's super hard to step away from it. And I think this whole workshop is one big exercise in talking about what is our water and maybe even jumping out of it a little bit and, and grabbing some air. So this is me in 2013. I moved cities. I moved from Breda in the south of the Netherlands to Rotterdam. And I started volunteering at this youth center called Het Centrum, which means the center. And there were a bunch of kids there that said, hey, we, we love to learn programming. I was like, oh, I can do that. I know programming. I will teach you kids some programming. So these are kids from age 8 till 13, more or less. And it's, it's an inner city um, community center. So this is a type of scene. You know, we had a few laptops, but it, nothing really happened there. Before. So I was like, OK, I can do programming. That, this is going to be fun. Hello, kids. Here are things you will love. We're going to do games and robots. Those are the things. When I was a kid, I loved games, I loved robots. You are kids, you will love these things. <laughs> Slight water stuff going on here. So the kids were like, okay, yes, that's fun. Sure, we will do these things that you tell us to do, teacher. So this might have very well been the end. It's very easy to just teach in a way or do something in a certain way. You do it, it's fun, the kids like it, the end. But of course, I was wondering when the kids went home. We used Scratch, by the way. It's a programming, a visual programming language by MIT for kids. So of course, I was wondering, what do other kids do in Scratch? What, what is going on there? And the nice thing about Scratch is it has a public repository. So Scratch itself is open source, but also kids can share their programs. And those programs are Creative Commons. And there are 17 million share programs in our public repository that you can analyze. So I was like, yes, I can do this. I'm a learner person. I'm a superhero. I can figure stuff out with my laser eyes. Well, OK, not my laser eyes, but my data analysis skills. <coughs> like, I can, I can actually figure this out. I have the skills, the superpower, to figure out what people are doing. So I downloaded 250,000 Scratch programs. And I did source code analysis on them. If you want to read this, by the way, this, um, I will present this at ICSI later this year. The, the whole analysis of everything we did. We found many things, but one of the most interesting, illusion-shattering findings we had is that only half of the programs had some form of interaction. Only half of the programs reacted to touch and clicks or sound or webcam. The other half of the programs had no interaction whatsoever. You just started the program and it did things without any input. So only half the programs were vaguely related to those games and robot type things I was talking about. The other half was other stuff I hadn't thought about. All those eight, nine, ten year olds online had thought about it, but not me. So it's like, okay, maybe we need different lessons. Maybe I'm not only in that programming water, I'm also drenching the, my children in that water, bringing my preconception of what programming is to these young, spongy brains that are just taking in whatever I tell them. So I need to do different stuff. So one of the things I did here, in, what you see here is kids working on my Donald Duck lesson. In the Netherlands, we have a Donald Duck magazine, a weekly magazine. It's the biggest magazine in the country. Everyone reads it. So the nice thing about it is that this Donald Duck universe is something all the kids know. So instead of having them make a game or make a, a robot, I give them a, a comic book and they recreate the story from the comic book in Scrabble. <coughs> so it's 
very interesting because it's about storytelling and the nice thing is this Doug Berg universe has many different types of stories. So there's uh, Scrooge McDuck goes out to find the treasure but also Donald Duck and Daisy Duck are in love and then the other guy happens. So kids can pick their own story but they're all in the same universe so they can easily communicate with each other. Here's another lesson that I did for a se uh, 70 kids and what you see here a little bit if you look closely is that they've all drew Mondrian painting. And this is another lesson that I do with kids where we, the, with a whole group, collaboratively create one program that can make many different Mondrian paintings. And for example, here I have the kids sit next to each other and they look at the other Mondrian painting and they describe what's the same and what's different about the painting. And these are the things that have to go into the abstraction of the program because if you have blue and I have yellow, then color is going to be an input into the program that can make both of them. So they practice abstraction but you can do it without a computer and then we all collaborative to work together. So all these type of things that have no interaction like comics and art <coughs> appear to me because I looked at what kids were doing, what not my kids were doing. So this was sort of what to teach. I was happy like yes I'm not doing all the techy stuff anymore. I'm teaching them different stuff now but I hadn't really covered how to teach. I was still teaching in the normal way, as many of you probably do. If I want kids to know programming, then we'll just practice programming. This is the standard way. I, even in, that new, in those new domains, I was still teaching in a normal way. So then I was like, hmm, thinking, thinking, what is programming? If I tell people, oh, what do you work on? Programming for children. What does that mean, programming? And then I was in Cambridge over the summer and I hung out with lots and lots of smart people. After a while, there was this sort of eureka moment where I thought, hey, programming is really a lot like writing, like creative writing, storytelling. Because if you think about it, ultimately programming is, you have an idea, a weird broad idea, like an app that tracks compliments. I really want this. If someone says something nice to me and I'm just like, can you say that again? <laughs> and then at night I'll listen to all this. That's what I want. So you have this idea that's super broad, you describe it in five sentences, and ultimately it will be transformed into letters and sentences. Just like writing. Maybe, maybe you use some diagrams, but ultimately it will become small things. Just like writing, if you have a crazy idea, like a frog, a frog murders foreign diplomats. This is an idea. And that's transformed into letters and sentences, just like with programming. Some writers do use diagrams, maybe they do some story plotting, some make character sheets. Like they draw, you know, this is uh, Fritz the Frog, and then they say, oh, these are his parents, and this is his background, and it doesn't end up in the story, but that's a designing exercise. And then if you look at models, so there are a few authors of course that have thought about what is programming, what are the steps of programming. Here are the steps that Prata has defined for programming. So it starts with defining the objectives, designing, writing, all the way up to testing and maintenance. These are seven steps and luckily we also we found another book about writing that also has seven steps so that nicely aligns in my next slide. So these are the steps typically associated with writing. So we start with gathering information, selecting information, structuring the information, all the way to reflecting on your tasks. And if you set them next together, you can see that there are some steps that are clearly the same. Especially in the beginning, gathering information and defining pro program objectives are super similar. Reflecting on text and maintaining source code are really similar. So it seems like that the broad idea of going from a plan to letters and sentences aligns more or less. And then there are a few steps that are similar-ish. So reflecting on source code is also a little bit like testing maybe and structuring your information is a little bit like designing. But you see there in the middle is where the interesting stuff happens, especially here. So on the right you have writing. One, one thing. For source code, apparently, there's only one step. To just write the source code. I have heard people say this in practice. You know, you have the design, now you just have to write it. But if you look on left for writing, 
there's translating, which we usually see as the normal the let, writing the letters, but also stylizing and formatting. These are separate, distinct steps in writing text, but not in programming. So in the middle is where the interesting stuff happens. If you, if you read the whole paper, then of course, well, we have lots of, to say also about the steps that do align, but now I want to talk about the difference, right? So style in writing is super, super important. Here is a snippet that's also in our paper that is written in a very hesitant style. I rather think that it was the same character I met, but where? In front of a church, in front of a charnel house. It has this whole hesitation in it, in basically in every sentence. So what could this be in programming? What is a programming style? Could you write a piece of source code also in a certain style? Of course, this is something, uh, and here you have two different programs, and you could say they're in sort of different style, because the first one is really dry, just explaining what's going on, but in the second one you have better variable names. You could say that's more like a story, because you're trying to like take the reader through what is happening, <coughs> but this is still somewhat boring. Maybe we want something like this. Maybe I want a, a, a hesitation keyword. Maybe for some lines of code. It, it, so this is not probability as in a random variable. This is just, I want a keyword to express, I'm not super sure about this. It, it, it's true, sometimes you're writing something and there are a few lines of code, you know they're correct. And there are a few, maybe you want to have the freedom to express hesitation. Because then you can convert more information to someone who's reading, reading it. If you have to debug this in five years, and I wasn't sure about one of the lines, maybe that will help you. And maybe also it will give you a different feeling if you're reading the source code. If, even if it's of no use in debugging, it's just I can convey extra stuff. So these are the things I think that we can sort of learn from. Formatting is also really interesting. So this is a diamond poem where the lines have this shape. This is how it like, normally looks without anything. And here it's all, all laid out with, with pictures next to it. This formatting is also something that we usually don't really think about in programming. I mean, we do think about it, but not at a very interesting level, like the tabs versus spaces type of thing, but there might be more interesting things to do. And some people say, this is a non-issue. So there are people who say, well, <laughs> coding style is a solved problem. We just have the creators of the language make style sheet and then everyone obeys that. Case closed. <laughs> I don't think it's all that like simple. Here you have two programs. and. It's already a discussion, is this the same program or a similar program, but at least they're similar in a sense. But the formatting is different because I move the declarations closer to the variables, where the place where the variables are used, or farther away from it. And this is definitely an exercise in formatting code in a different way to maybe support the user. So you might ask, and also some of the reviewers did ask this, and why is this interesting? Okay, two things are similar, but what can we learn from it? Because if you go to a high enough level of abstraction, everything is similar. Like, I am an object. This table is an object. But what can we learn from that? So let's, let me take you through a few highlights of what we can learn from this. First of all, on the, on the very, very small level of this comparison. <coughs> For example, if you juxtapose those steps, you see that in programming, we do have some interesting forms of formatting. Syntax coloring, syntax highlighting. This is something we're really very used to in programming, and there have been papers that show that this actually helps you. <laughs> Could we have this in writing as well? Maybe it, this is super useful for novice learners, or maybe it's also super useful for people, if, if I have to read French, <coughs> I had to do that yesterday, I know some French, but my grammar isn't excellent, and if the syntax there would be highlighting of what the verbs would be, that would greatly support my understanding of a French sentence. Or even, especially for French, 
just where the words end if people speak would be very useful. <laughs> so, so maybe this is useful. Maybe the, those, the, the baby steps can learn from each other by reflecting on how they would look like in the other field. This is like the tiny detail level. But something that's even more interesting, and Tom Haas already talked about this a little bit, is that if you use a certain metaphor, that shapes how you think about something. Even if you don't want to, it just happens. So a metaphor from writing that I absolutely love is the difference between panthers and plotters. This is how novelists talk about their process. And what panthers do is, if they write something, they just write something. So their step one is to take their pen, write all the things. I am definitely a panther. I just want to get my idea out, and then I will just iterate many times. Heavy rewriting, this is why the heavy work happens if you're a panther. If you're a plotter, then you start with an idea, you make a plan, and you just write it. So this is the plotting part, and this is the panting part. And this is how novelists classify themselves. There are even blog posts about, from famous writers that say, oh, I'm, I'm a panther, oh, plotting is, plotting is better. It's a bit that versus case. So I think this is really interesting also for programming. I, I have started thinking about myself. Okay, I'm a panther in writing. Am I also a panther in programming? And am I a panther always? Well, sometimes you're plotting if you're making a design maybe for a customer, but sometimes if you make something for yourself, maybe you're more panting. This is a metaphor that's super helpful for me. And then if you realize, or if you look at what metaphors we use now, <laughs> architecture, you see that the metaphors we use, architecture, building, scaffolding, are very much plotter-like. Plotter yeah? This is how you make a bridge. Then you're a plotter and you make a bridge and then you make some designs and then you actually make the bridge. You, you can't pant your way out of a bridge. You can't say, yes, I don't know. Hello, city, you want a bridge. I don't know how this bridge will look like. I'll just start a little bit and then I'll see how it feels. And then we do some more. It, it, just, it doesn't work. You can't make half a real bridge. So then you see that this metaphor of building an architecture is maybe limiting our brains towards a plotter mindset, where a better mindset sometimes might be useful. And you see that as a field we're going somewhat from waterfall to agile, you could also say we go from plottering to pantering. And maybe if we had thought of programming as writing earlier, we wouldn't have been so waterfally because it sort of happens if you think if something is engineering, then it's almost immediately not pantering because engineering is planning because you can't pantry your way out of a bridge. So this is how metaphors really change. And there are many m metaphors for programming, of course, apart from engineering and writing. There's also gardening and knitting and recipes, and they all have their values. But you have to realize that if something is a prevailing metaphor, it will influence how you think about stuff. So yeah, we think about making bridges like we think about making apps. Another reason why this is super interesting, and I started this story talking about how I'm also an educator, not just a researcher, is now I wanted to know, can I teach programming like we usually teach creative writing to kids or grown-ups? So one thing that works really well in writing education is observational learning. This is where a teacher does something while also explaining what they're doing. So they say, yeah, when, I, when I create a story, I first make a plan. And then they draw, maybe they draw the character sheet of Fritz the Frog. They say, well, his parents left him at an early age, and that makes me feel a bit sad, so this is going to be a sad story. They draw the story, or write the story, while explaining their steps. Like this. Fritz is really sad and upset, he's leaving the bond. So maybe we can do this for programming as well. Maybe a good way of teaching is live programming while I'm explaining my thoughts. And I think it's really interesting that this does happen somewhat at conferences, for example. There are many uh, professional conferences, well, so much academics, but professional conferences. There are developers that they live program, they explain what they do. But this is not normally 
something people do in the classroom, especially not with young kids, but also in university. Life programming from the classroom is not like the common thing to teach. Usually it's just PowerPoint slides with syntax rules. Maybe there is something there, and it seems likely that this would also work. And another thing you can, we, we can learn from writing education is that what's really known to work very well is forced integration. There have been lots of experiments of combining writing with natural sciences. So one course about science and writing, kids, you explain them some science and then they keep a diary. Or they make a poster, they use language exercises to deepen their science knowledge. And this is known to increase their grades in both science and writing. So this is interesting, maybe we can do that for programming as well. Maybe we can integrate programming and language and get really good results. And then we're, we're back at the Dom Duck lesson that we use, where initially I just asked kids build a comic in Scratch, but now we're also doing reflection on the stories. So they pick a story and then they have them ask about each other's story. Was it a love story or was it an adventure? And who was the proponent? And who was the opponent? And these are exercises you would normally do in a language class. So we're totally integrating programming education and language education. And the hypothesis there is like with language education and science education, this will make their scores increase in both fields. And hopefully also this will lead to more creative kids that have a broader view of what programming can be. Because in, the, in that science and language integration course, the kids that took the integrated version of the course, not only did their grades increase, but also they said that they felt more like a scientist and they knew, knew more about what science, scientists are like. That was everything. I know it was a lot and I also know it's super early and some people went to party yesterday. So let me summarize everything in one minute. So this is your like second shot. <coughs> Keep waiting for 60 seconds and then at least you have the gist of the talk. So what we're going to talk about today is the water of programming. We are in the programming space all the time, so sometimes it can be super hard to know what is what. My stance on this that I learned sort of the hard way by forcing robots and games on kids is that programming is not just like building, it's also very much like writing and we can take inspiration from that. The metaphor of architecture has its value, but other metaphors might be also useful. And if you stick with one, you might be limiting yourself. I truly believe, and I'm researching a lot at the moment, that we could learn from teaching kids creative writing how we can teach kids programming better. For example, by using observational learning and integrating programming courses with language courses. That was me. I'm Felina, this paper and also all my other papers and 400 live blogs about all sorts of sciencey stuff are on my website, I'm on Twitter as well. People always ask me how did I make this slide. It's with an Apple Pencil that is awesome and the app GoodNotes and thanks to many smart people. That's it. So I think we know how to switch between these two computers. <laughs> so I can do the do my oh, yeah, critical comments um, and then we can we'll have more space for questions. So I sit up? Is that the I think you can sit down. Yes. Unless you want to sort of dance around. <laughs> I'll sit here, so I'm close for questions. We're actually we're actually doing good uh, good old time. This is surprising. <laughs> I thought with so many switches and everything. Um, cool. So um, when I was I was reading the paper and I was thinking what what were the what were the interesting things that I could learn from this or maybe what were the the crazy things that we could we could say if we take the idea to the extreme. Um, and um, so my, my sort of critical commentary on the, on the paper will be more on the side of trying to take things in an in a extreme and possibly silly but maybe inspiring ways. Um, and I, um, given that we have very short, very short slots for this, I, told, I took sort of two basic, two basic ideas from it that I thought are somehow interesting or you could do things with them. Um, and 
the first one, the first thought I had was around the formatting and styling, where um, if we if we take the idea of formatting matters to the extreme, like how far how far can you go? So I did a little bit of online search and I found this, um, which is uh, is that Mario? It's Mario. C. Um, so this is, a, this is a C implementation of Mario from the International Obfuscated C Code Contest, um, and you can see that they really they really do something with the formatting here. Um, it doesn't help you read the code, but that's that's not really the point here. Um, so it's sort of it's sort of using the formatting to tell you something about the program. Um, and you can see it just as a joke, but maybe there's something interesting in that in a, in a more deeper sense. Um, can you do the same thing with writing? Well, turns out you can. So this is a poem by uh, Václav Havel. Um, and in Czech, it's Adidekajdi Vlastní Cesto, which means let everyone go in their own way. Um, and it has this repeated line, let everyone go their own way, let everyone go their own way, with one line in a sort of shifted or wrong angle, which is crossed out with access. And um, so if you, if you read, um, if you read the Wikipedia page on, on um, the book where this appeared, then one of the references actually says ASCII art, um, or one of the links on Wikipedia says ASCII art. Um, so you can definitely use formatting in, in, in literature, in writing, um, but what I thought was a, was a sort of really interesting contrast between the two, where um, if you look at it from the sort of very high level perspective, they're all using formatting, do some tricks on you, but um, in um, what can the what can the formatting what kind of effect can it have? Well, um, in in both writing and programming, using formatting you can make it easier for people to read things. So um, if you just format things nicely with colors in in code, that will be easier to read. Um, in writing, you can distinguish bits of poem and it will be easier to read. Um, they can, uh, in some sense, I think the formatting can support the meaning. Like Fedin had this example with the Diamond poem, uh, which had sort of kid-friendly formatting, had illustrations, so it supports the meaning. Um, I think possibly in programming, if you're sort of using formatting to do things like spaces and correct indentation in C, you're helping the meaning. Um, but what I thought was really interesting about the poem example was that in the poem, the, the key component of the, of the meaning actually came from formatting. So in the poem, you couldn't format it differently. It would, make, it would just not be not be the poem. Like the whole trick of it was in formatting. Um, and I think this is something we don't really know how to do in programming. Because in programming the formatting is always somehow secondary. So uh, can someone come up with a programming language where uh, the formatting would actually be the, the, the Mario picture that you write in, in your C code would actually define what the program does. Um, <laughs> was that Python? Python. Well, I think Python is somewhere in the middle. Like, it makes you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced. <laughs> I think Python with like or just space indentation is doing some of it, but it's not as profound as as Python. Just isn't as profound as Václav Havel. <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my conclusion. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're aiming towards something like uh, uh, setting cryptic crossword puzzles, where mm. you know, the, the whole uh, the general theme of a cryptic crossword puzzle is a is a clever combination of, of form and context. So mm. uh, this one phrase 
part of it describes the new meaning of the word, but the other part describes the, the, the construction of yeah, the whole yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, so, so here you're hoping for a programming style <coughs> where the programs you write are a, a very clever and intricate uh, combination of the content, which is the algorithmic part, but, but also the way the these concrete will fit together. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this was this was this was the first thought I had from reading the paper, and I don't really have a have a um, clear idea of how to do it. But I think if we want to get some interesting, crazy ideas from the parallel between programming and writing, then this might be this might be one space where uh, something yet unexplored can be found. Um, now the other part that I, I, I found interesting about the paper, um, and um, I think this one will be more on the side of um, where I will I will disagree with something, um, is when we when we look at the process of writing and process of programming. So I, I looked at I, I was reading the paper and it has this nice list of, of steps that you do in programming or in writing. Now, I don't do a lot of writing, um, but I do quite a lot of programming, and it always strikes me that this is not how I do programming. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, well, I definitely never define programming <laughs> <laughs> um, I sort of go here, then maybe a bit here. Um, so, um, now I think this is this is definitely capturing some of the steps that we do when programming, um, but whether it's sort of as clear, um, definite as clear process or as clear steps, um, this is this is something that I found fairly tricky, um, and it when I when I saw the list and the, the sort of process of doing things. Um, it reminded me of um, <coughs> a lovely book called The Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, where the, the, one of the main characters is, is teaching writing, creative writing, and at some point, he, after, after going through all the rules that the students should follow, he says, well, uh, the, rules, the rule was pasted on the writing after the writing was all done, it was post hoc after the fact instead of prior to the fact. And he became convinced that all the, all the writers that the students were supposed to mimic uh, wrote without rules, putting down whatever sounded right, and then going back to see if it sounded right and changing if it didn't. And then the, the, the idea from, the, from this was, well, the, the, the really interesting writers um, will just write and then someone else will come and say, oh, they write like this and create the rules. Um, and I think it's really easy It's really easy to say, oh, but this is just the sort of very exceptional writers. But I think most of the, most of the writers probably follow something that sounds more like this than the, than the process that is very clear. Um, so, I sort of wondered what is it? What is it about the, the process and the the um, and the process versus or order versus chaos in, in programming and writing? And I think in um, well, the, the first thing is um, when we when we talk about process and, and steps, we maybe it's useful when we are describing what we see around but it becomes less useful when we try to prescribe and say, oh, this is the process you should follow. Um, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, I think in, in writing, you can really easily imagine that this is, uh, that what, what Emoid Piercing um, had, a, had a very sensible grounds because writing is such a creative and you can't quite easily put a handle on what's, what's going on. Um, but I think in, in programming, um, the situation is sort of more constrained 
because in the end you have to you have the sort of hard constraint that the computer has to run your program. And so, what can we what can we do to figure to to sort of um, approach programming in a more free sense? Um, well, obviously, we should just write programs for reading and not for execution, because execution is what constrains the, 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 the creative act of programming. Um, so I think if I, if I want to be extreme and say, what, what can we learn from this parallel between programming and, and writing? Well, you just shouldn't, shouldn't be bothering about running your programs because that constrains you too much. Um, now, does this sound very silly? Who thinks this is very silly? Yes. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I was hoping someone would say it's silly because uh, this idea of programs just for reading, um, I can trace it back to the, to the Algol definition, where in the Algol definition, they actually have a section on publication language. So if you're, if you're learning Algol, they'll tell you how to write Algol code for the computer, and then they'll tell you how to write Algol code for people in books. Um, and they mostly, they just use sort of prettier types of thing, um, but you're allowed to use Greek letters in Algol for publication. So I think this, this idea of doing uh, programming just for reading is actually, it's actually has been around since 1960s <coughs> and quite surprisingly it hasn't almost at all evolved since 1960s. So if you read some pseudocode, it will still be in the Algol publication language even though it's 50 years later. Um, so um, what I got from the paper or what sort of <laughs> inspired me is that maybe we should, we should liberate programming from the tyranny of execution. Um, <coughs> um, and uh, the, the um, specific thoughts were, well, I really think this idea of formatting, carrying more meaning, more meaning than in Python, is, is one interesting thing you can get when you, when you try to marry writing and programming because in writing, there's really more to the style and more to the formatting. Um, and um, I think what I learned from the sort of parallel with, with Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance is we should figure out which rules might be worth breaking. Um, and I think the, the one nice thing of doing this with pseudocode is that it's very cheap. Like you don't have to spend half a year writing a compiler. Um, if you just want to experiment with pseudocode, so that's uh, my take on the on the on the topic, and I think we have next talk in ten minutes, so we'll have ten minutes for discussion and uh, and uh, questions. Sure. I think Kevin, uh, now it's probably your uh, you're the main person. Thank you very much, Kevin, for a fantastic talk. Nice. Very very starting off the workshop. Um, I, I, I was inspired by the talk and I'm writing notes during the talk, but also by Thomas's comments about um, this. I thought, I thought you were going to say uh, literate programming. You said literate programming. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but uh, a lot of what you're both talking about is this literate programming. Yeah. So that, that has evolved since the 1960s. Um, so Luth wrote about it in 1974, and it's, it's now kind of the, uh, particularly in, in uh, Haskell. Ecosystem. Mm. It's, the, it's the primary way of writing the program. Yeah. And you, you I thought you, you were to going to mention Jupyter Notebooks and all the data <laughs> science it. people. No, 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 no. Well, that's another thing too. <coughs> and uh, and, and that, 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 that draws from the same source. But um, you don't have to... Uh, I, 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 like, I like liberation, but you don't have to give up on the execution altogether. <coughs> Still, you can write your programs first with the human reader in mind, and, mm. and, and secondarily with the computer in mind. They, they, the humans and computers don't have equal rights, and you can prioritize the rights of the human reader over those of the computer. Um, and so, so then writing your program is, is, very, is much more of a creative writing thing. You, you have some algorithmic ideas that you want to present, or the details of, a, uh, of an algorithm, um, and, and you write an essay 
illustrated by fragments of code. Um, that is simultaneously the, the, the <coughs> and, and the ex uh, something from which you can derive the executable source. So I, 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 uh, programming is writing uh, definitely. Yes. And uh, 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 I, but I, I also really like your point about the story of the fish in the water and so on. So. Um, I find myself in my department, I, I'm, I'm still doing the same thing I've been doing for 20 years in my department, and uh, um, uh, it used to be the core of what my department did, and it's no longer the core of what my department does, it's gone off and doing all sorts of other things. And my colleagues all say to me now, on the programming, that's all done, we, we know how to do that now, we have, we have Java, why do we need anything else? Um, uh, they're, they're, they're new fish in the water, and they're surrounded by programming, but they don't see it. Yeah. Um, and I find that quite sad. I need to drag them out of the water a bit and show them what it will be like without the water. Um, a couple of comments. Uh, one, first one is that there's a very nice book that's called If Hemingway Wrote JavaScript, yes. uh, which is recommendable to, uh, to everyone. Um, my, my other comment is, uh, well, what if it was the other way around liberate execution from the tyranny of programming? Uh, yes. because um, uh, one of the things that struck me, and I'm not sure I can quite articulate this, that when you're, you're, you're programming, is what you're constructing the text. No, it isn't really. It's, it's this program that is somehow constructed from compiling or interpreting um, the, uh, the, the text. And, and is the focus actually then wrong if you look at, at, the, at the text as the, the product of the, the act of, of programming? So it's teaching writing, actually teaching the wrong way of thinking of what you're doing, because what you're doing is actually constructing this running complicated system that unfortunately you have to do through uh, programming language, which, which I guess in hopefully in not that many years will look like stone and chisels. I would say the metaphor still holds, because I would say that also goes for writing. Because what I really want to convey to you if I'm writing a story is not the letters on the book, it's the emotions or the stuff that happens. And I have to use these silly letters because we don't have a little yeah. mind meld yet. But if I could just transfer it to you directly in your brain, that would also be but okay. I think so I, also I, I, letters I, are a, a means to, the, there, it's, it's, there's meaning in there. And that's what I want right. to transfer. I thought I was so. thinking about that as well. What is the difference? And there, there's something about the formality of, or it's a formal yeah. system uh, in a computer, whereas uh, the, interpretation of the text is subjective and yes. culturally uh, influenced, which means that, for instance, if we need a compiler that could pa pass the, uh, the Hubble uh, poem, it, it, would, it would need to be an AI, basically, that had uh, an understanding of the culture and was embedded in model. Uh, <laughs> that would, of course, be nice, because then, then we didn't have to write formal programs anymore. Um, so, when you were talking about uh, liberating the uh, the programming from the uh, execution. I was thinking the the well. So in a program, when I write the actual code for my for my system, I uh, there are a lot of constraints there. I want it to run. I want it to run correctly. I want it to run fast. I want it to have the least redundancy in the code. So I guess that uh, making this uh, also. Uh, so it has to be readable for humans who would need to maintain, but but um, but make this uh, with the same attribute as I want my story to be. Uh, this is um, le less of a good fit, but the, the place where this actually uh, fits very well is, I think, the tests. Um, so I've been doing um, uh, behavior-driven development for a while, and I recently started using uh, tools that actually make the document, allow me to do free-form documentation of my code and have code snippets that are the tests. And by using, by doing that, I do two things at once. One is that I document my code in a way that is readable by humans, but unlike, unlike for example, pseudocode, it is something that is tested all the time, so I know that it is uh, effective, and I know that it's up to date. And it, the second thing I do is I um, I put my thoughts in order, 
in a way that allows me to uh, allow me to test all test the, my code that is not such nice. It's like it's just code, not prose. Uh, but it allows me to test it in a way that is um, fine grained, so that every small piece is now tested. And like the, so the approach that used to be that when we, in your list, uh, testing was just after yeah. I already had my code. So if I do the testing, at least thinking about the testing before I write my code, then I don't have this large piece of code and now let's see how do we test it? How do we see that it does what it's supposed to do? Yeah, that ties into the, where Thomas mentioned is the list prescriptive or descriptive, of course, mm -hmm. also with writing, it was also at the bottom. And you all know that if you write a text, then you don't write an entire book, and then you're like, hmm, let's figure out if this makes sense. Even at sentence level, you already do some rewriting. So it's more an abstraction of the process than this is how you should do it. Mm -hmm. And then I like your, your remark that a test might be more like a small story than a whole mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. This could be an interesting exercise because a test sort of is a what if story. What if mm -hmm. a customer exactly. orders a exactly. burger? <laughs> exactly. Now everything goes wrong. So tests might be might be a nice way where you could really because also they're small, so it doesn't take that much effort. Where you could really try to make a test into really a story where maybe mm -hmm. comments and mm -hmm. lines of code interleave. But also of course... I have to step in as a process okay. police <laughs> just so that we can get the next speaker set up. So if you can come over and... No, you can. can I finish my thoughts? Yeah, you okay. can finish your... So the final thing I wanted to say is that what I'm saying is not every line of code is a story and you should be writing everywhere. It's more like let's take inspiration from this metaphor and think about what is formatting and what is style. Not that all your algorithms should be stories. That's a bit different.